Aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Motion approved. I have uh, received notice from the Minister for Communities that she wishes to make a statement. Before I call the Minister, I remind Minister that in light of social distancing being observed by parties, I have relaxed the Speaker's ruling that members must be in the Chamber to hear a statement if they wish to ask a question. Members do still have to make sure that their name is on the speaking list if they wish to be called, but they can also do so by rising in their place as well, but preferably notifying the Speaker's office so that we, we do catch that, they, that there's an interest to ask the question. I remind members to be concise as they ask the question. There will be a period of one hour for questions from members to the Minister. And if time permits, there may be an opportunity for a second question from our members. Minister. <coughs> Thanks very much and thank you to all uh, members and I suppose just to start if you see me looking at my phone it's my sister's been taken in at half ten to have her baby so <laughs> if you see me looking that's why I'm looking at, waiting on news um, on the arrival but I suppose just to start with I'm pleased um, to have this opportunity again to provide a further update to the assembly on the work being taken forward across my department and with multiple partner organisations to support and protect those most in need during this public health emergency. To begin with, um, I wish to place on record my sincere thanks and appreciation to all of those within our society who have gone the extra mile to help strangers, to help their families, their neighbours and their communities during this crisis. It has been truly humbling to witness the extraordinary efforts and selfless actions of so many people. This includes my staff within the Department for Communities, our partner organisations, local councils, and in the voluntary and community sector, local sporting bodies, faith organisations, and many, many community activists who have all played their part in protecting those most in need at this time. In a statement to the COVID-19 Ad Hoc Committee on the 9th of April, I advised that one of my key priorities was to ensure that our services uh, were reconfigurated in a way that maintained delivery of our suite of social security supports for those most in need. Officials within the department have faced a dual challenge to quickly adopt the social distancing measures to protect our staff, whilst also responding to the unprecedented demand for our services. During this period, I have widened the eligibility criteria for some of our support to provide further help and to direct the support to people who find themselves in a crisis situation as a result of COVID-19. This has only been possible by the swift introduction of significant changes as to how we operate, and this has included removing some processes, such as suspending reviews and reassessments for health and disability benefits for three months, and introducing necessary changes to the discretionary support scheme. Since the onset of the COVID-19 crisis back in the 16th of March and onwards, there has been an increase of 294% in claims to universal credit and a 110% increase in claims to Job Seekers Alliance. That equates to around 71,000 applicants for universal credit, with an average of 7,900 claims per week. Staff have been working extremely hard and we have made 140,294 payments on time, uh, data from the, 14th, or the 16th of March to the 14th of May, representing around 99.3% of all payments due, to, due by then. Members will be aware that Universal Credit Standard Allowance has been increased for everyone by 86.67 a month. And in addition, everyone making a new claim to universal credit can also apply for non-repayable universal credit contingency fund grant available through the discretionary support. This is publicised through NI Direct, the main citizen-facing information portal, as well as the department's uh, social media channels and through a network of independent advice organisations and community organisations at the grassroots. In terms of discretionary support, a number of steps have been taken to improve our ability to respond to the increased demand. 
We have amended the regulations to widen the grant eligibility criteria to provide a grant for short-term living expenses to assist claimants affected by COVID-19. For applications, we have increased the income threshold to £20,405, and we have changed the debt threshold from £1,000 to £1,500. This will ensure that more people on low incomes can access emergency financial support. An online living expenses grant application form is also now available on NI Direct, and staff have been redeployed to this area to ensure that we can manage the increase in applications. The form can be completed and submitted online without the need to download or email. From the 16th of March to the 15th of May, my department has delivered over £2.3 million in discretionary support payments through 13,278 awards to people in need. This includes just over £1 million uh, due to over 6,863 people, uh, new COVID-19 living expenses awards made to people directly impacted by the coronavirus, which was one of the legislative changes I introduced with the approval of this Assembly back in April. And I know these payments have been a lifeline to many in society and enable them to provide for their families and keep them safe in line with the government guidelines. We have also suspended face-to-face -face, uh, appointments across our jobs and benefits network and medical assessments for PIP ESA. Access to telephony channels will continue to be available for anyone claiming universal credit, PIP, ESA, JSA and discretionary support. However, given the significant staff ab absences experienced across all benefit operational areas, it is taking long, uh, longer for some calls to be answered. To help new online application forms for ESA and JSA have also been introduced and are now available on NI Direct. These forms can be downloaded, completed and emailed directly to the relevant benefit area for processing. The minimum income floor in universal credit has also been suspended for the duration of the outbreak, meaning every self-employed person can now access in full universal credit. It ensures that the self-employed are fully supported by the benefit system, the social security system, so that they can follow government guidelines on social distancing and self-isolation. I will be making further amendments to assist the self-employed by ensuring that the treatment of payments made under the job retention scheme to fund payments to the self-employed person's employee are applied appropriately and not taken into account when the self-employed person's universal credit award. In addition, any other loan or grant to meet the losses of their expenses of the claimant's business in relation to the outbreak of the coronavirus disease is to be disregarded in the calculations of the person's capital. Changes have also been made to ensure that, a person, uh, loses, that if a person loses entitlement to universal credit on account of their income, the Department will treat the person as reclaiming universal credit for up to five assessment periods rather than closing their claim, meaning a person does not need to make a new claim if earnings reduce. As well as delivering on our priority to get money into the families and households to alleviate hardship, I have taken the decision to suspend the recovery of benefit overpayments and loan repayments from a number of social security benefits for a period of three months. The measure will provide some financial easement to people with benefit overpayment related debt or an outstanding loan balance. The change will mean that many people will see an increase in the amount of money they receive in benefits during these three months. Recovery of all social fund and discretionary support loans will be suspended and customers currently making repayments through a bank uh, standing order may wish to contact their bank to cancel their arrangement. However, this will need to be set up again following this pause period. For uh, people repaying through uh, other means, the Department has already written to employers asking them to stop the deductions from salaries, and all recoveries by direct debit will also be suspended for three months. I remain committed to doing everything I can to ensure that those most in need and the most vulnerable receive the maximum amount of financial assistance and support during this difficult time. 
We have also progressed a range of other interventions to ensure that support is made available to all those in need. One of the early department interventions in partnership with Advice NI was the establishment of the free phone COVID community helpline. This service is available from 9am until 5pm, seven days a week, um, to ensure that the most vulnerable and those at risk of COVID-19 have access to practical support services and emotional support at this most, at this most difficult time. Working collaboratively, departments, health and social care trusts, local councils, community and voluntary organisations and the private sector, we put in place a programme to distribute food to vulnerable people across communities and also those who are self-isolating. My department is investing £10 million in the service over the next three months and so far over 70,000 food boxes have now been delivered uh, to those who need them. The Food Parcel Service has been hugely successful in getting immediate food and essential supplies to those in need. The Vital Service will ensure that those most in need in our society who do not have a support network or family or friends to help them through this emergency will have access to basic food supplies. It will also allow those at risk of social isolation to see a friendly face and know that we as a society have not forgotten about them. There is a tremendous amount of goodwill and generosity in the action across our society, and it's very welcome at this challenging time. The access to food offer of support is broader than online shopping slots and food parcels for those most at critical need. Council coordinated volunteers can also assist with shopping for those who need it. Hundreds of community organisations have availed of funding to assist with food support to vulnerable people and over 200 spa, euro spa and vivo stores, as well as a large variety of independent retailers at the local community level, are now also offering home delivery services to help those who are unable to get the groceries themselves. If anyone is in need of food or other advice or support, they should contact the COVID community helpline in the first instance. My department has also been working with the Department of Health the Health and Social Care Board and the four major supermarket retailers to put in place a registration process for those who have been advised by their GPs to shield for 12 weeks and who may need to feel of priority online shopping delivery slots. This is a welcome development and I hope it will address the very real concerns and frustrations expressed by people in getting uh, access to regular food supplies. One of the other priorities is to ensure the safe delivery of medication uh, to vulnerable people and those who are isolating and cannot arrange for anyone to collect their prescriptions. We have been working closely with the Health and Social Care Board and other health partners to ensure that the necessary arrangements are put in place to allow this to happen. My department has taken the lead in responding to the challenges that the community and voluntary sector organisations face and introducing a range of flexibilities in terms of conditions around grant funding, including upfront payment and reduced bureaucracy. To enable this to happen, my department has prepared the necessary contracts for funding and paid out over 9.5 million in grants payments to over 300 organisations since the 1st of April. I have also ensured the protection of the management and delivery of three programmes under the people and place strategy. And this strategy supports over 300 projects across 62 geographical areas of deprivation. These important community projects have now received six months advance funding, totalling 7.6 million, to enable them to continue delivering vital services to those most vulnerable within our communities. In addition, we have introduced the COVID Community Support Fund, releasing 1.5 million initially through local government's existing community support programme. The funding has enabled um, our local councils to directly support grassroots organisations in tackling poverty and helping those in greatest need. And I hope to make a further announcement on the next step um, of this funding soon. Following the recent announcement regarding financial support for charities and the allocation of 15.5 million in the Barnet Consequential to support charities here. 
I have been developing plans to launch an executive scheme to support charities impacted by COVID-19. Many local charities are at the front line in responding to this emergency and in supporting our most vulnerable uh, citizens, both now and as we plan the recovery phase. I recognise the impact in which COVID-19 emergency has had on traditional fundraising activities and that this is a worrying time for many charities. The charity sector is made up of a diverse group doing fantastic work in our local communities. And given that this is a limited fund, it's not going to reach everything, it is important that any scheme to support charities is carefully considered and ensures that the best possible use of our resources is available to support and prioritise the needs within the sector. And I am having discussions with executive colleagues and hope to be in a position to make an announcement on this programme later this week. I am conscious that other sectors are facing significant challenges at this time. I have announced a new £1 million COVID Creative Support Fund, which will be a mechanism to support individual artists and institutions in finding innovative ways to combat social isolations and address wellbeing challenges. The arts sector has uh, such an important role to play in keeping spirits high, but also importantly in promoting their creativity in these difficult times and again as we move into a recovery period. I also recognise that sporting organisations at every level, from grassroots to those who compete at an international level, are facing serious financial challenges as a result of the COVID-19 restrictions. I have worked with Sport NI and the Sports Forum to take immediate practical steps to support sporting organisations, and this has involved an early release of the 2020 to 21 Grants Awards and a launch of a hardship uh, fund for sport. The £750,000 hardship fund managed by Sport NI has provided financial assistance through a grant of up to £2,000 to sports clubs and organisations to assist with essential overheads and the cost of maintaining their facilities during the COVID-19 lockdown period. The level of demand for the financial relief through the Hardship Fund for Sport has been exceptional, with over 350 applications received since it opened on the 14th of April. And I regret that for now the scheme has had to be suspended pending uh, the assessments of those applications that we have already submitted. The suspension of the scheme will continue to be kept under review, and I would hope, subject to additional funding, becoming available to be able to open the scheme again in the future. I am very conscious that the impact of this crisis on construction and on tourism have created very significant challenges for the heritage sector. My department owns 190 state car monuments. Access to these are restricted in line with public health guidance, but I am pleased that we are able to keep these accessible to pedestrians. It is important that other priority work within the department is able to continue, and I can advise that the officials in our public records office um, have been liaising with the executive office, the Department of Justice and the Historical Institutional Abuse Redress Board to process requests from vulnerable victims and survivors who gave evidence to the Historical Institutional Abuse Inquiry. And Prony's work has been critical in allowing the Redress Board to begin compensating victims and survivors. During this crisis, I have also been very conscious of the need to provide assurance to households facing difficulties in paying their rent. And while we received initial commitments from both the Housing Executive and all of our housing associations to treat such cases with extreme sensitivity, I have followed this up with legislative cover to strengthen protection to private renters during the COVID-19 crisis. The Private Tenancies Coronavirus Modifications Bill was approved by this Assembly on the 28th of April, and it ensures that landlords will now be required to give tenants a 12-week notice to quit period. This legislation will protect private renters, securing their accommodation and allowing them to protect their health and reducing the movement of people. It will also enable vulnerable people to shield, self-isolate and social distance. A document providing housing-related advice to assist tenants and landlords to remain safe and secure and comply with obligations while um, observing social distancing guidelines was first published on the 16th of April this year. 
A further update was provided on 6 May to reflect the extended notice to quit period arrangements contained in the Private Tenancies Act. And the guidance is hosted by, um, on the DFC website, NI Direct, and linked to websites of partner organisations, including housing rights, councils and housing providers. In my statement to the Ad Hoc Committee, I outlined the importance of protecting the homeless during this crisis, and the Housing Executive have set up a dedicated team to manage their response to the crisis and have put in place a number of interventions to support homeless individuals or those threatened with homelessness. We will continue to take all possible measures to prevent vulnerable people from sleeping on our streets, and I would commend all of those who have worked with us to make sure um, that this has happened and to keep people safe. And I am extremely grateful to my executive colleagues for again yesterday prioritising a further £10 million in funds for the Supporting People programme. This money will maintain the delivery of housing support services across a wide spectrum of organisations, doing vital work with older people, people with disabilities, those with mental health and wellbeing issues, those who find themselves homeless or threatened with homelessness, and also vulnerable young people. And these funds will be used to address the significant staff shortages in the intermediate term and mounting pressure in this area. If the number of COVID-19 cases in these supporting people schemes continues to increase, the funding allocation represents our commitment to vulnerable people in supporting people schemes and staff providing support to them. We support them and we are working hard to ensure their safety and well-being. Today, I also want to recognise the important role being played by local councils in helping to support and protect uh, people in need during this public health emergency. And I'm aware that councils are facing significant financial pressures, mainly due to the closure of their facilities and resulting in a loss um, of expected incomes. The losses sustained to date are such a magnitude that councils will soon be unable to meet their financial liabilities. I am therefore uh, delighted that they uh, received executive approval to make an immediate intervention to avoid a cliff-edge financial crisis developing within local government. And the executive again yesterday agreed to make funding available of £20.3 million to my department uh, for local councils to alleviate these financial pressures. This intervention will provide relief to our local councils to protect the delivery of vital frontline services during this crisis and ensure that councils are ready to play their role in our post-pandemic recovery plans. I have also introduced legislation to relax some requirements in respect of local government meetings and to enable them uh, to have meetings to be held by remote means, including via telephone conferencing, video conferencing, live web chat and live streaming. Provision has also been made for remote access to council meetings by members of the public and in addition information which generally has to be made available at council offices will now be made available on council websites. These measures will enable councils to continue the effective delivery of local services while being mindful of the public health and safety of their members, officers and the public. It is vital that we facilitate the, the continuation of council business whilst adhering to public health guidance and enable our local councillors to continue to participate in democratic local government. Following discussions with the Department of Finance, I am pleased to provide confirmation that councils are eligible to apply for the furlough staff scheme through the job re retention scheme. And my priority has been to ensure that the rights of workers are respected um, and to protect jobs. And as Minister for Communities, I have endeavoured to put in place a range of highly responsive and targeted interventions to help and support families and those who make up the very fabric of our society, including charities, voluntary organisations, sporting bodies and the arts. Now that the Executive has published its roadmap for recovery, I will continue to monitor the adverse impacts of this pandemic on these target groups and will engage across government with our partners in the voluntary community sectors and the private sectors to address further issues as they arise. Whilst we are all focused on moving out of this current crisis and obviously still ensuring that we protect people in the midst of this pandemic um, and looking at a phased approach to recovery, 
It is uh, very clear that we will be in a very different place as a society at the end of this process. And I want to ensure that we retain the very best elements of our response to the COVID-19 pandemic by embracing a new sense of community spirit and togetherness, by acknowledging and recognising the efforts of our key workers, and by protecting our most vulnerable within society and addressing the systemic inequalities that exist. I trust you will find this update helpful, and obviously I look forward to the engagement. Thank you. And now we have a period for questions to the Minister. There will be a maximum of one hour. Can I remind members that it is not an opportunity for debate or long introductions? Um, there may be an opportunity uh, at the end, once everyone has asked the question, to afford a second question if time remains. Some latitude will be shown to the Chair or Deputy Chair of the Committee. I will now invite uh, Kelly Armstrong to ask the first question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Um, I stand here today as Deputy Chair of the Committee's Committee, just our Chair is not available at the moment. We wish her well with, with the private matter. Um, Minister, thank you very much. I just want to put on record our absolute appreciation for yourself and your department. Um, Anybody reading that statement will see the amount of work that has been going on by the department. And um, while everyone recognises the key workers in health, um, without the hard work that has been put in to help people on benefits, people who are being introduced to benefits for the first time, um, people who have had no idea how benefits work, it has just gone to show just exactly how calm and not stress-free, but um, the process has worked quite smoothly today. In fact, we heard that there has been a 90% increase in the number of people who have become unemployed um, through this pandemic. So the fact that we're not having public outcries every day in the media about benefits systems and access to benefits says a lot about your department. Um, just moving on to the, the detail of the statement today, I absolutely welcome um, your announcement that there will be some movement forward on the charity sector. Um, this is something that that has been causing a lot of concern given the fact that the Department of the Economy has been announcing quite a number of um, business support grants but the charity sector has been left out and I would urge the Minister to do all that she can to ensure that that payment can go out quite quickly. The Minister as well identified that we will be in a different place as society moving forward and I'm delighted um, and welcome the Council funding that has been announced today of 20.3 million. We met as a committee last week and heard from Solus um, who outlined the financial difficulties that they were having so we're absolutely delighted that that's the amount of money that has come forward from the executive to help those councils that have lost out on income not generated through for instance leisure centres and so on. Could I just ask Minister if you could confirm Sorry, could I just ask, Minister, if you could confirm, is that 20.3 to cover this period of three months, um, or will there be more to come if there is any further extensions to rates? Um, and will the councils be asked to help to prepare for this different place as society by working with and within the community to identify where PPE and other um, protections would be in place for the community. So it's just to find out the 20.3 million for councils, is that just for this first three months? And will the councils be asked to use part of that money to advise businesses, charities and so on about PPE going forward? Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and there are two important areas. I suppose I'll just start on the charity stuff. I mean, obviously, uh, we got the announcement a few weeks ago in terms of the Barna consequentials. I know the finance minister obviously made the announcement around the hospices. So we have the remaining 15.5 million. Um, it has taken a bit of time, obviously, to analyse the impact on our charity sector. We have a wide range in charity sector, um, some of which also include social enterprises. Um, because there's no legal definition of what a social enterprise is, but obviously a lot of them have charitable uh, outputs and they're going to be included. I will be outlining plans as to what this is going to look like, and obviously my announcement will include um, the quickest delivery that we can get in terms of actually getting money out onto the ground. And I think the important thing is we have over 9,000 charities um, registered and who meet the legal definition of a charity um, here in the north. 15.5 million is not going to meet all of the need. And obviously at this point, what we have to analyse and to look at is 
what keeps the charities, uh, what are the critical overheads at this time as we're dealing with the pandemic do we need to meet? Um, and that's what we're assessing and looking at. But I am thankful, obviously, the funding has been agreed at the executive yesterday, and I will be announcing uh, the rollout of that um, this week. The other issue then on councils, this funding is initially to meet costs between now and the end of June. Um, so it is for the, the immediate costs and impact of the pandemic at this point. Obviously, my department's been working with Solus. They sit on the emergency leadership group at an executive level as well, and they feed in on a daily basis. So we know that there's been critical issues for the councils. Um, we've obviously had information from councillors themselves coming through from across all of the parties. Um, and obviously we needed to respond, so we'll be working with them in terms of this allocation um, in the next day or two, again, to get that money released as quickly as possible. I know the finance minister will be making a statement after, um, and that will also include um, the issue for councils around waste management as well, which doesn't fall within my department, but there will be other announcements there too. I can invite Jonathan Buckley to ask the question. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for a detailed statement. And as a member of the Communities Committee, I do indeed welcome the most of the content. Uh, one point in particular on page 7 that does give me considerable concern regarding the hardship fund for sport. The, the closure of this, the grant within two days, as has been mentioned, due to demand surpassing funding allocated. In correspondence with Sammy Wilson, MP, my colleague, uh, the Minister outlined that uh, of funding awarded, some 40 per cent had been allocated to the GAA. I think this is grossly weighted, and I would like the Minister to maybe outline what engagement did she or her department have with the relevant sporting organisations prior to the scheme's launch? And secondly, in the design of the scheme, what consultation did her department have and give consideration to equality impact across the different sporting sectors in Northern Ireland? Because we do know, as the members been mentioned, this question, the members severe... ask this question. Okay, so thanks very much. And I suppose the first thing is, is that this was an emergency fund to respond to the crisis um, that was done here. Um, it's not enough money to meet the need. Um, and obviously we don't have enough money in terms of meeting all of the need that is out there. But we did move quickly, um, working with Sport NI and also the Sports Forum, uh, which represents a variety of sporting organisations and codes in terms of the delivery of this fund. Um, and I know that it's been welcomed by all of them, notwithstanding that it's not enough money. Um, so that scheme was uh, launched. Everyone got the same information and update at the same time in terms of the launch of that scheme. Obviously, the demand has been unprecedented. We had to close it or suspend it. It's not closed, it's suspended at a point uh, because we just need to look at assessing the applications that are in. From the applications that are in then, we will see which money can be made available and then is there any money going to be left over. I am working with officials. Obviously, we're continuing to engage with the Sports Forum and Sport NI around looking at can we um, lift this process again to allow other organisations to come in. Um, but obviously, I mean, I take no role in terms of the assessments of applications. They are done by staff who are trained, who work within the sports branch. Um, I didn't have that breakdown figure right away. So, I mean, I don't, I mean, the detail of that is very much done by officials um, adhering to in terms of how they issue public funds. Uh, but for me, I want to get as much resource and support to all of the sporting organisations. I mean, I've worked on a regular basis over the last couple of weeks and months uh, with the two junior ministers, with Ulster Rugby, with the IFA, with the Ulster GAA, um, in terms of responding to this pandemic, but also looking at what implications the pandemic has on sports. We have obviously worked very closely with the Sports Forum and Sport NI, which represents all sports at all levels. Um, and I want to continue to do all that I can to address the needs. But obviously this is within, um, I suppose, tight finances, where obviously we're trying to deal with the immediacy um, of this pandemic and addressing issues of homelessness and trying to make sure that people are safe. And these are some of the, I suppose, the balances that we have to get right. Um, but I'm continuing to look at this, and if I can make greater flexibilities to allow more uh, sporting clubs to get into that grant, to increase the money available, um, I'll be continuing to look at all avenues to ensure that I can do that. I call Sinead Innes. 
Minister Muggett, uh, last can call you. And I thank the Minister again for coming to the Assembly and, um, and outlining her interventions, which to date have been entirely citizen focused and entirely um, based on what uh, ensuring the, the collective well-being of our communities. I think it's absolutely right that the Minister has outlined her protections for, for councils. Can we, we come to questions, please? Yeah, I will. We need to ensure our councils are, are adequately resourced. And just on, on, on that, um, can the Minister give us any more detail um, as to how the, the money for the councils will be divvied out, if you like? Um, because I think we need to ensure that there's a, there's a, a fair distribution across council districts um, and that, that some councils aren't impacted um, more than others are um, in terms of, because I know people have made a, in our committee about um, certain reserves the councils might have, so I think we need to ensure that there's an adequate and fair distribution of the of the money that the minister has been has announced. And I wonder if she could give us some more details on that, please. Yeah, well, thanks very much. I suppose it's been a, a big um, investment from the executive to provide this funding. Obviously, we've been working with Solis and with local councils to look at the need. It's not that it will be an even calculation across all of the councils because. That obviously is not how it works. Um, councils have different, I suppose, um, issues um, and difficulties that they have to deal with. So it will be tailored to the needs of each of those councils as well. We're continuing to work with those over the next few days, so I don't have a table in terms of a breakdown of that finance just yet. Obviously, we were dealing with issues of furlough, which is more than half the amount um, the request that councils had made um, in terms of uh, finances that they need. So we're continuing to work through some additional uh, issues uh, with the goal of getting that money released and out as soon as possible. Once that's been uh, done um, and the table has been agreed and signed off, um, I'll make sure that uh, members of this chamber and indeed the committee have that information. I call Mark Durgan. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for her statement. I have been very complimentary of uh, most aspects of her department's response to this uh, crisis. And while I have been critical of some, I do not for one second underestimate uh, the difficulty of addressing this wide range of issues as they emerge. Uh, reference has been made to the startling statistic this morning that we have seen a 90 per cent increase in unemployment here. And the sad likelihood, if not reality, is that we are going to see more and perhaps even more dramatic increases in the number of people seeking that support. Is the Minister confident of the capacity within her department to deal with further such increases? And does she have plans to increase capacity in that aspect of her department's work and indeed in advice services as well? Yeah, thanks very much. And it's an important issue, and it's obviously one that I meet with my officials in the department on a weekly basis, um, because it is an important issue. And obviously, at the outset of this pandemic, I wanted to ensure that payments were made to people as quickly as possible, and particularly those that were in financial crisis. It's no uh, secret, and I've said it on a on a regular basis in this chamber, but also outside the unprecedented demand in universal credit claims. The fact that we have had over 71,000 new claims shows the impact that this pandemic is having. That's obviously um, almost, you know, thousands of people who all of a sudden overnight no longer have a job um, that they are at, um, or they've been let go on a temporary basis. And indeed, that could get worse depending on the outworking of this pandemic if we get a second spike depending on the furlough scheme. I know it's been extended, and obviously that is to be welcomed. But again, we don't know what this is going to look like further down the line. Um, there's obviously been the additional pressures, which um, I haven't um, shied away from, in that we are working at around 30 per cent, just over 30 per cent in terms of our staff. Part of that is obviously due to those who are self-isolating. The other part is obviously to ensure that we adhere to social distancing measures. Obviously, I visited one of the offices in Straban on Friday an office of over 45 people, and then they're working on a rota basis over a three-week period of having around eight or nine people in the office at any one time. Obviously, that reduces um, the personnel that we have, but that is to ensure that our staff are safe, and obviously we have to do that. But the service then, um, I have to ensure, isn't impacted by that. And I suppose I have to commend the work of the staff in that we have 99.3 per cent of payments have been made on time, even in a period of unprecedented increase in terms of claims. And that has been down to those critical frontline essential workers and going above and beyond and coming into work, but also working from home. So we have had to change our practices 
and this is how we've been able to do it as well in getting more uh, technology available for those who are working from home to ensure that they can do that and the payments can be processed. Also, to work at a shift basis where we're bringing people in um, throughout the day and over the weekend if needed as well. We needed that at the initial period um, of the spike in the pandemic uh, also. But again, what we're also looking at, so I am confident going forward that we do have the capacity that we're starting to plan that in and to mitigate against any eventuality that we may have in the future in terms of responding to this virus. That has to be said that all of that is being done because we have stood down some other procedures within the department in terms of suspending face-to-face. -face. So as we move through um, this pandemic and if there are easements, if we start to open up our public buildings again, all of that's going to have to be assessed. And again, with keeping staff and keeping members of the public protected, that has to be uh, the number one priority. The issue, obviously, in terms of unemployed and benefits, it is something that we're looking at um, in terms of our employability programmes. We're starting to look now um, at the recovery period and what we're going to need to do in responding to those that now find themselves in the social security system in terms of how we get people back out into uh, the workforce again and what we can do to support them. So again, I'm going to be meeting with officials over the coming weeks um, to start to plan that out. That will have to sit with what the Department of the Economy is doing in terms of recovery and indeed the executive um, as a whole. But I am confident our staff have been excellent throughout this whole period. They've been really committed in terms of helping those most in need. And I'm confident that we'll be able to manage that in the time ahead. I call Andy Allen. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her statement. Minister, a recent survey from CO3 and the Institute of Fundraising has highlighted that uh, a survey of 206 chief executives has highlighted that the majority of those have indicated that cash flow is a major problem, and 92% further highlighted that they were ineligible for other grants. Um, the Minister herself has indicated that the, the charity fund, the £15.5 million allocated as a Barnet consequential, will be limited. So can the Minister maybe perhaps outline what additional support her department is considering to further supplement that fund? Well, it is a limited pot of funding and obviously there are pressures. Um, I know CO3 have been doing an analysis and obviously they have engaged over 200. We obviously have over 9,000 charities that are impacted and they're impacted in different ways. Um, we have uh, obviously in three brackets, we have charities that have an income of less than 10,000. Obviously those charities between 10,000 and a million. Um, and from the analysis that we have done, we know that they will be the ones that will be most severely impacted in terms of uh, this pandemic and obviously lost income and fundraising. I suppose from the 15.5 million that we have um, from the Barnet Consequentials uh, for this funding, we want to make sure that that funding gets to as many of those charities as possible. We want to make sure this isn't about meeting the longer term costs of those charities. This is about meeting the critical short term costs. And that's why the proposal that I will bring forward this week will start to look at charities on an individual basis in terms of what are their needs. We're also asking to look at other measures, you know, so can they furlough their workers, for example? Are there other supports that can be brought in? I've obviously also written to um, the Minister for the Economy, and I know she's looking at it at the moment in terms of the £40 million grant that's available to ensure that social enterprises and charities can avail of that also. That said, you can only avail of one funding stream from government. You can't be double funded um, in terms of that. And we also know that there are many charities that are government funded as well. Um, and I know within my department, any organisation that gets funding that we have paid that up front, we have given advance payments uh, to those. So we're going to continue to look at this. We're obviously meeting with NICFA and others who have done surveys, looking at the impact on the community and voluntary sector and some of their initial analysis would say that there's over 350 million that would be needed in terms of that sector going forward. And I wouldn't have that finance, obviously. So we want to continue to work with the sector. We want to work with those grassroots organisations who have been responding to this public health emergency and defending essential services at this time to look at what additional supports we can bring in. Um, a large part of it, I mean, it was touched on in one of the other questions, society is going to change here. And I think there does need to be questions asked in terms of what we finance, how we finance um, as an assembly, as an executive going forward. 
and it has to be around um, having an inclusive growth um, approach. It has to be around looking at issues such as community wealth building um, to ensure that we can retain wealth and focus wealth and growth within the communities um, and to target those people who need it the most. So I would hope in any economic recovery that we start to look at those measures and looking at issues um, of, I suppose, institutional um, inequality and what we can do to remove them. I will be bringing forward a proposal soon in terms of developing the anti-poverty strategy and the child poverty strategy. So again, there will be opportunities there to start to change how this institution and this assembly responds to those most in need. Um, and again, I'll welcome members' uh, input and engagement on those issues. So I will update members. I mean, it's good that we're going to get this 15.5 million out. Um, an announcement will be done this week to give, um, I suppose, an assurance to those charities that the process is now starting. Um, uh, I know the economy minister is looking at the £40 million scheme. And then, obviously, we're going to have further discussions on support uh, for the social economy uh, sector as well. We kind of seem to fall between two stools because there's no definition of a social economy. Um, so it's something that we're looking at also. Members, there's a further 14 people have indicated so far they wish to ask the question, and I need your cooperation so I'll be able to afford the opportunity to as many as possible. I call William Humphrey. Uh, Minister, for her statement and for the support that this executive and the Belfast City Council have given to the elderly and vulnerable in North Belfast. Minister, sporting and recreational clubs are a key part of our fabric of society. Many of them have missed out on the ten and twenty-five thousand pounds grants that have come from the Department of the Economy. Many of them were unable to get uh, any assistance from your department. Can I ask what further measures you can take? Because there are gaps for some of these clubs in terms of funding they need to survive. They have low reserves. They don't have an income on a, on a regular basis. And many of them staff by volunteers. Can I ask what more you can do? And I would implore you to do more so that those clubs are there to assist our community when we move at the other side of this dreadful virus. Well, I think a couple of things. Um, they do play a vital role um, within our communities. Um, they're going to be key, even in terms of the impact of the lockdown, the impact on children and young people um, who are actually missing their sports at this time. Um, sporting organisations are obviously going to play a vital role in terms of the health and well-being um, of those people as we move through um, into the, the next steps in terms of our uh, approach out of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, I suppose the, I am looking to see if I can extend the existing fund um, in terms of the sports COVID fund, the hardship fund that I have launched. I have also uh, written to the Minister for the Economy in terms of those other grants. I believe that sports organisations should have been able to avail sports in terms of where they have a business element um, in terms of their, their organisation. Um, so I, I was keen and I'm waiting just on the outcome of what the Minister is saying around that. I know that she is proactively uh, looking at that at the moment. I'm obviously continuing to engage with the Sports Forum and also Sport NI to look at what additional measures we can do. And obviously what I also want to bring forward is obviously the development of our regional stadia and sub-regional stadia programmes as well to ensure that we can start getting things moving again also um, in terms of those essential um, key infrastructure pieces uh, that need to be developed. So we're looking at all of this at the moment and as I start to bring forward more programmes and proposals, I'll update members as we're doing that in the time ahead. I call Linda Dillon. Can I thank the Minister for her statement and I'd like to concur with the, the comments of Kelly Armstrong for the phenomenal work of the Minister and her staff and officials and what they've done so far. And just on the back of the last question, I think that what you have brought forward in terms of self-employed actually highlights the failures of the economy, Minister. And I just am wondering in moving forward what recovery plan we have around helping those self-employed and ensuring that the economy minister picks up the responsibilities because they, this should not fall to the communities department, it should fall within economy and those people should not be left behind. I think, uh, well, I suppose the executive is looking at a recovery plan. I know the economy minister is going to bring forward an economic recovery plan as well. Obviously, my role is to ensure um, within any of this 
that we have a different type of economic outlook in terms of that looks after the most vulnerable, that tries to lift as many up uh, within our communities, that looks at a fair distribution in terms of the wealth within our communities um, also, and where there's a focus on small to medium enterprise in terms of the bedrock um, of our economy also. Um, so, I mean, there's been good collaboration across the department as well, but I suppose it's not for me to answer um, the questions for another minister. I call Christopher Stilford. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In the minister's statement, she mentions the fact that there's been a huge rise in unemployment, and in previous answers, she mentioned key infrastructure pieces. One of the most significant arms length bodies relating to her department is, of course, the housing executive, who are working in conjunction with housing associations to deliver significant build projects. I'm referring specifically to Hope Street in our own constituency. Can the minister give this house and me an assurance that no action by her department will delay further the development of Hope Street and the associated development of additional housing in Sandy Row. Thanks very much uh, for your question. I suppose, me and we've been meeting. There's been a lot of work over the last three months that have been focused on the pandemic, and obviously there's been a slowing down in other parts of the department. But we are focused on the issue of housing and new housing bills. It's a priority for me as a minister when I come into post in January. I have been doing meetings over the last couple of weeks with the department. There's obviously been a change in personnel as well, um, with one of our, our leads in housing and regeneration. Um, but we are committed in terms of developing the housing programme. It's obviously been impacted because of the pandemic. Construction has stopped. Um, I suppose LPS and also building control and planning had stopped. Um, but as we move through with councils now up and running in terms of their planning, in terms of building control, starting to get back to work um, as well. I am hopeful that we will move forward. The big thing for me is obviously we're trying to protect the capital budget, um, that none of that is lost to ensure that we still meet our housing targets um, as we move forward. So I will be outlining plans in the time ahead in terms of my vision around housing and increasing the housing stock. And of course, I mean, I know the issues in Sandy Row, I know the community I live in and the market have engaged with community activists in Sandy Row um, as well, and the Hope Street development will be a vital development in going forward. So I am committed in terms of taking that forward as well to address the needs of that community in terms of connectivity and to ensure they feel the benefit, and also for the city as a whole to ensure that those physical and social and economic connections are felt um, as well. So I'm committed to doing that and happy to talk with you further after this. I call Declan McAleer. I'd like to thank the Minister for her statement, and I'm very glad in her statement that she made reference to the important role that the um, community sector has played throughout the course of this pandemic. One of the, the um, schemes which the community sector has played a huge role in is the uh, delivery of the food parcels. I know that in uh, isolated rural areas has been a, a great lifeline for people. How do you get an opinion on the effectiveness of the food parcel schemes and what are the plans for this scheme for the future? Gormagod. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I suppose, I mean, access to food was one of the critical areas as we were entering into the pandemic and obviously this was an emergency response in terms of ensuring that we could get essential food to people um, who needed it. So whether those who were self-isolating and shielding who didn't have any other uh, support networks to go and get them the available food, or indeed those who were in financial crisis that maybe lost their jobs, had reduced incomes, had increased expenditure because they were at home, to ensure that they also had access uh, to food as well. I had said from the start that I wanted to build in. So this food programme, it's a million, or sorry, ten million pounds that would be over the initial 12-week period. So that was the three months for the shielding. I built in a six-week review to that programme, and I'm currently looking at that at the moment. In terms of obviously, because we were responding to an emergency, it's not a perfect programme, albeit it's meeting need. Um, so I did want to review it halfway through to ensure that we can make necessary changes if that was needed. Uh, we are making changes. We have obviously been liaising. There are 18,000 people that receive food parcels here every week um, across the north, and obviously the role of councils also DERA um, in terms of their personnel and also the Department of Infrastructure in terms of public transport um, and getting these food parcels out to those who need it uh, also. So we're going to review the programme. We're going to see if there are other things that we can do. The reason that we have stopped at 18,000 is because of the three wholesale suppliers that we have 
can't go beyond 18,000. They can't do more than that in terms of packing uh, the food parcels because they have to again adhere to social distancing. And that's the capacity in the contract that was signed up to. We are looking at that to see if there are other ways that it can be done. Because I know that there are issues that if you're a, an older person living on your own, some of the items in the food box, you don't need it every single week. And therefore, obviously, we don't want wasted food. Um, but I want to ensure that people get the food that they need. So we're liaising with councils. All of the 11 councils have a, a key food lead within their councils. There are daily calls with my department in terms of looking at this. So we're looking to see um, if the products can even be, um, I suppose, delivered to the council distribution points. And then can councils then tailor the food boxes to the constituents that they know and to the lists that they know to ensure that people are getting the types of food that they want. I obviously also want to look at the issue of health and well-being within the food boxes to ensure like things like fresh fruit and vegetables um, are also put in as well. So there's a review of that being done. I'm meeting with officials this week and then we'll communicate that um, with councils and indeed with the wider uh, public as well. I am also reviewing, as I said in my statement, on top of the, the food boxes, the parcels, um, I also um, had released 1.5 million in a community COVID fund, which again was disseminated through the 11 councils. I'm looking at that as well in terms of replenishing that fund, um, because I know again that that's um, delivering critical need and services um, through the 11 councils. And again, I'll make an announcement on that in due course. Can I encourage members to continue to address the chair, to assist the microphones, to pick up what they are saying? Can I call Daniel McCrossan? Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And Minister, can I put on record my appreciation to you for visiting my constituency in Straban uh, uh, on Friday? It was greatly appreciated. And to uh, witness the great work that goes on by the local Straban Community Project, Fountain Street Community Project, and also uh, the uh, Jobs and Benefits Office. I, I would say, Minister, just as a, as a point, because I know that my fellow colleague across the chamber uh, will probably not have had notice, I only received notice of your meeting five minutes before uh, you arrived, at five can to ten. To the I, I, I'm just making a point, uh, Mr. And Speaker. It's important. The question, uh, I think it's important that we have prior notice. Uh, but I do appreciate your visit. Uh, just in relation to the work that's going on there in communities, Minister, I know you've acknowledged and witnessed firsthand the great efforts that have been made and the life-changing uh, 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 work that's going on there, uh, uh, particularly through this pandemic. What other funding will be available to sustain this work going forward, given that the Straban Community Project, in particular? is a lifeline to so many people, particularly the elderly and vulnerable in society beyond COVID-19. They faced some cuts, Minister, as you'll know, in recent times. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. And I was delighted to uh, visit Straban on the issue of notice. I'll look at that. Um, obviously, all members of this House um, should be getting the appropriate notice that I'm going to be visiting or that any minister is going to be visiting. But I'm glad you were able to be there um, amongst other parties. And I suppose one of the first things, I mean, it was a real community hub in the church hall, St Pat's Church Hall. Um, when I was there last week in Straban, you can see the food operation, which is there in terms of the food boxes that are going out. There was obviously the engagement and collaboration with the Fire and Rescue Service in putting out essential fire and rescue information, um, because obviously a lot more people are at home. So I do commend the work. I also visited the grassroots uh, coffee shop, which my department supports in terms of the social supermarket. And indeed, that's part of a pilot across the north that I want to expand. And we're at a business case um, development at the moment in terms of expanding those social supermarkets more broadly um, in terms of what we're doing. The issue of food parcels, I mean, all of this obviously was to address the immediate concerns um, in terms of responding to the COVID-19 because the public guidance, the guidance from the Assembly was to ask people to stay at home and particularly those that had to self-isolate. And obviously we had a duty and responsibility to respond to that. Uh, we also have a responsibility then to manage this as we start to move through the different periods. And indeed, that's why I had built in a six-week review of the programme. But we also need to look at this beyond the 12 weeks and what's going to happen after that. This will have to dovetail also with the anti-poverty strategy, because what this pandemic is really exposing is the inequalities that existed before this pandemic. Um, the, I suppose, 
the structural inequalities that we now need to remove. Um, the pandemic has also shown that if the will is there, we can remove them, uh, notwithstanding, obviously, the financial um, stuff, because we still are reliant on a block grant from Westminster rather than having our own economic levers. So we do need to look at all of these issues. And I suppose when I was in Straban and any community that I'm going to be visiting, I'm giving a commitment to them that I want to work with communities. Um, I want to give the power to communities in terms of being part of the decisions. And that's why all policies and strategies going forward will be a co-design process, uh, working with those organisations in the time ahead. Obviously, some of the work um, in Straban in terms of the immediate funding, I mean, I know one of the partnerships there are a neighbourhood renewal partnership. Before this pandemic, I obviously wanted to give assurance to neighbourhood renewal partnerships, which are based in our most socially deprived communities in terms of the Noble Index on deprivation. I have extended their funding for two years. Um, I had already given that commitment, and that was to allow time to design a new programme of what a new anti-poverty programme will look like, and again, given a commitment to those neighbourhood renewal partnerships, that that will be done in a co-design fashion, so it won't be done on to them. It will be done with them um, and in partnership, working with them uh, in the time ahead. So we'll look at this going forward. I'll obviously outline um, other, uh, I suppose, implementation or other um, interventions that I'm going to make. Um, but again, this will be a broader conversation in terms of society, in terms of how we allocate budgets and funding, um, in terms of, I mean, I feel in terms of having our own financial levers so that we can make decisions ourselves um, in the Assembly here. Um, and I would encourage society and communities um, to stay involved in those conversations. I want to bring forward pilots looking at community wealth building. So looking at the wealth within a community or a council area, trying to work with local government and others um, in terms of supporting small to medium enterprises uh, within our communities, but also su supporting communities to come up with projects as well. So I also want to look at uh, developing cooperatives and having a culture of cooperatives within our communities and within our economic system uh, as well. So as I start to move through these um, and working with the sector, I'll keep the assembly and the, uh, the, I suppose the committee updated as I do that. And again, any suggestions? I'm always open. I don't have all the answers. Any suggestions? I'm more than willing to work with members. I call Gemma Dolan. Concordia, and can I thank the Minister for her statement and commend her on her department on the work that's um, ongoing. Um, reports suggest measures taken to address homelessness during this pandemic have been effective. Can the Minister outline what steps were taken to achieve this, but more importantly, what can be done in the future to address this issue? Yeah, I suppose this is a critical issue, and again, it's an issue that I really wanted to look at when I took on the role as Minister as somebody who's campaigned as a housing rights campaigner um, for many years in my own community. Christopher touched on even the likes of Sandy Row um, in terms of the impact. There obviously was a, an immediate health issue in terms of homelessness by way of those who sleep rough on the streets. And I suppose that's not the only type of homelessness that we have within our communities and within society. We obviously have thousands more people um, up to 30,000 people who are what's known as sofa surfers, who, may, who don't have a home to call their own. So I think it's important when we're talking about the issue of homelessness and the focus on street-based homelessness, while that's important, it's not the only type of homelessness, obviously, that is out there. But in terms of the street-based homeless, there obviously was a concern um, in terms of the impact of this virus. Those people would be more vulnerable to contracting the virus. They would obviously be more vulnerable in terms of the spread of the virus and the impact that that would have on, on the health and social care system. There was immediate response then to that um, and immediate interventions um, that I had released in terms of upfront funding to the Supporting People programme to ensure that their contracts and their funding were paid in advance. I quickly engaged with the housing executive, who is obviously my arm's length body and who has responsibility for this issue. They immediately set up a team to look at this and to ensure that we had no one rough sleeping. And I think it was also important that that included those that had no recourse to public funds, that we included those people um, in the midst of this as well. 
From that then also we worked with the health department and with the health and social care boards and a nurse led team was established as well looking at those with higher vulnerabilities and those who are homeless um, and that nurse led team has been working really well so a collaboration between housing and health. Obviously with the announcement today of 10 million additional pounds going in to the supporting pre uh, people programme. That's going into those providers on the ground that are working with those who find themselves on the street. Um, it's working with those who are homeless in other forms and also working with those with underlying maybe addiction issues, mental health and wellbeing issues, and particularly young people who are, who are even more vulnerable um, being on the street or being homeless as well. So there's been excellent work done, and again, it goes back to the point that if there's the will there to do these things, it can be done. This shows... This pandemic shows that it can be done, and obviously I'm committed to continuing that um, in the time ahead. And I suppose I just want to end by thanking all of those within the department, the housing executive, or supporting people providers, those community activists on the ground who have been working on this issue over many years, and who I will be working with in the time ahead to ensure that we do improve the quality of life. The other issue in terms of the broader homelessness issue, obviously we do need to build more social housing. We need to have an increased programme in terms of the availability and the kind of housing going forward. That's one of the issues that I'm currently looking at. And I will outline, I suppose, my vision going forward uh, in the time ahead. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if a £2,000 grant yet to be accessed by many sports organisations is actually enough for sports clubs to survive COVID-19? And if the Northern Ireland Executive has established a return to sport expert group to work with Irish and UK government return to sport groups to support sports clubs in Northern Ireland to return to practice? Yeah, I suppose there's never enough money um, in terms of the need that is there. And I suppose what we're trying to do, we quickly released the 750,000. We have obviously suspended that at the moment, but I would like to get that started again um, as soon as possible, uh, if I can get the money available to me. Obviously, what we're trying to do through this pandemic, we're not going to meet all of the needs. It's a bit like the charities funding or any funding that comes forward. We have to look at uh, what is critical in terms of overhead or costs that we need to keep uh, these organisations going through the midst of this pandemic. And that's the assessment that we're doing um, at the moment. So it won't be to meet all of the costs. And indeed, there'll be some organisations that will need it more than others, depending on what their output or their makeup, or depending on what their overheads are. So we're looking at that at the moment. As I said, I've obviously written to the economy minister as well in terms of the business uh, support grants that are available, that they should be available to sporting organisations for their business element, um, for those that have it. We obviously know as well the furloughing scheme has obviously assisted many sports organisations and sporting codes who have been able to furlough their workers. Um, and I have to say, who then have in turn been out on the streets on a daily basis responding to the pandemic, so they just haven't went home and put their feet up. They have been working tirelessly um, in terms of responding to that. My officials are engaging with officials in England, Scotland, Wales, and indeed in the South, in terms of looking at a programme as we start to move into a period of opening up again, um, that we're looking to see how we can do this. Obviously, the north-south is going to be critical as well because a lot of the sports are played across the island on an all-Ireland basis also. So we need to make sure that there's synergy there um, and we're going to continue to do that. As we move through that, we'll obviously update the executive. We're working with the chief medical officer and the scientific officer to look at easements that if we are trying to get people back out on the playing pitches and, and playing sports, that that's done in the safest way. Because I suppose the main thing, coronavirus is still here. People are still losing their lives. And obviously, any return to these activities has to be done in a managed way and ensuring the public health and safety is number one. But we'll be continuing to liaise with all of them um, in the time ahead. And indeed, as I have more announcements, um, I'll make those in due course. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, as many others have said, it's admirable the amount of work that the Department of Communities has done to get money out the door to um, people who have lost their jobs or people who have been otherwise affected by 
um, COVID-19. But COVID-19 is clearly a health crisis that disproportionately affects older people. However, the employment and economic crisis disproportionately affects younger people. A report out today from the Resolution Foundation shows that up to a third at UK level of younger uh, of the people may either made redundant or uh, just losing their jobs or furloughed have been young people. We face a real possible long-term crisis for this generation this who are question? entering. Yes, I understand that, Mr Deputy Speaker, but it's an important question. Is her department doing serious work on the effect on a generation that could be um, lost to this crisis who are entering the benefit system now? We need her department to be joined up with the economy department, and, and is that happening? Orders during questions to, to the Minister, perhaps after this period. Thanks very much for your question, and it's an important one. And I suppose it's, of course, it has an impact in terms of older people and younger people, but also on poor people. And we know that viruses like this or any economic downturn impacts on poor people the most, also. And when you look at issues of imposed austerity, um, again, that impacts on poor people. We've seen studies, for example, in Spain recently, um, that it has been the most deprived communities that are being impacted in terms of death rates around coronavirus um, as well. So obviously, I want to look at protections. Again, that's why I said earlier that we do need to have a new conversation in terms of what our economic and social outlook is like in the future. It's not good enough just to build an economy that grows, that looks at those who are doing well, that we have to ensure that those who aren't doing well, those who are deprived, um, those where structural inequalities exist, we need to remove them. And we need to have a serious conversation um, about that in the time ahead, because if we're not removing those inequalities, then we're not dealing with those. We're forgetting about that 30% and we're moving on. So it is critical um, as we're moving through this. Obviously, my department are looking at this. We know even the impact of the virus alone in terms of health and well-being, in terms of the impact on children and young people, not being able to see their friends, not being able to see sports. This is already under a situation after a decade of cuts of austerity um, and the impact that that has had. This is obviously coming out of decades of conflict and the impact that that has had um, on the mental health and well-being of our people as well. So there's obviously layers of challenges that we need to work through. Um, there's layers that we need to remove. And I suppose, again, what this pandemic has shown, that some of the red tape and bureaucracy can be moved very quickly if the will is there to do it. That's notwithstanding that, obviously, there needs to be prudency and you need to look at finance. But if the will is there to do things quickly, I could move legislation here a couple of weeks ago in two weeks. If the will is there to do it, it can be done. Um, and I do think that we need to have a bold vision in terms of what our society looks like uh, going forward. Um, I am going to be engaging with the departments. I've obviously, I had met the economy minister even before this pandemic, because obviously there are clear linkages um, and we need to look at an economy that works for the people and not just for um, a few. And there are issues that I want to look at. I want to look at bringing forward, as I said, community wealth building models. Uh, cooperative development models. And again, I've been working with organisations out in the community. Um, I'm looking to engage the Nevin Institute and others in terms of um, an economic rethink um, that protects the most vulnerable within our society as well. So I'm going to continue to do that. And again, any suggestions that people have, I'm more than willing to listen. Obviously, I will be bringing forward plans for an anti-poverty strategy, the children's poverty strategy, um, the gender uh, equality strategy as well, and others, um, the disability strategy. So all of these issues obviously will feed in. That has to be cross-cutting across government. It's not going to work if it's only within my department. All departments need to be buying into that um, in a serious way. So I will be outlining my plans for that. I'm obviously going to work with those communities, with older people, with younger people. This is going to be a co-design approach. So young people will be involved in this, along with the Children's Commissioner and others in the time ahead, and the same with older people um, as well in terms of co-design and that. So totally get your point. Um, I think it's a critical one that sometimes is missed when you're looking at economic recovery um, in terms of those who are more impacted uh, than others. But there is engagement at an official level within the two departments. Um, as to what the recovery is going to look like, how we deal with the issue of increased unemployment, 
But again, what we have to deal with is the systemic inequalities, the structural inequalities um, that exist as well, and I'm committed to doing that. The Minister, having answered her the question from another member, can I now invite Mr Laster to raise his point of order? Yes, um, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Several times in this statement and questions, you have upbraided members to be brief, and yet it is clear to anyone, surely, that the problem here is not the verbosity of the members, but the verbosity of the Minister, who has gone unchallenged about taking endless time, three and four minutes, to replies to questions. Could you not apply a little parity of esteem on the issue, please? The member has made his point. And we are still just about on schedule that everyone will be able to ask their question and get a fulsome answer, uh, but everyone does need to be careful with their time so that everyone will be afforded that opportunity. Can I now, can I, further point of order? Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And in conjunction with what Mr Alistair has said, I think it is appropriate for you to, to talk to the Speaker's office about reviewing how the functions of this place works, because during COVID-19 there are many questions potent questions that members would like to ask, and they are being harangued by the Chair to speed up their answer and not having an opportunity to question the Minister. At a time such as uh, COVID-19, we are given limited space and time in this House to ask questions. So I would ask that you review this mechanism to enable members to answer, ask the questions of Ministers and gain responses. Again, the member has made his point, but can I highlight to him the standing orders in which uh, I am being asked to cover this statement and questions to the Minister, and I am endeavouring to do my best to do so. And I do believe everyone will be afforded an opportunity to ask the question uh, if we are allowed to move on. That is something that the Speaker's Office certainly will have taken note. And I would ask all the parties to reflect on how uh, we are governed, because we are governed by the standing orders. And everyone needs to carefully assess if you wish to change that or not. Can I now invite uh, Robbie Butler to ask the question? Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for your statement today. And in your statement, you mentioned uh, about the PIP and ESA period uh, being suspended for medical assessments. Would you like to give us an update on that today and indicate if there's any backlog, any problem with that system? Question. Obviously, um, I have made the decision to suspend for three months. Um, and we have been moving to telephony. That doesn't suit everyone. And obviously, the important thing is, is payments are continuing to be paid. Um, this was obviously in line with public health guidance in terms of social distancing, in terms of isolating, staying at home, only going out when was normally necessary. Um, so we will continue to review that, um, obviously, as we approach the three months to see whether there's a need to extend that or not. Um, we'll do that in liaison with the Chief Medical Officer and the Scientific Officer as well. I call Justin McNulty. Thank the Minister for her statement and for her answers thus far. Minister, whilst I welcome the many positive announcements uh, in your statement today in terms of supports, I'm very surprised that there's still no mention of cross-border workers, many of whom have fallen on very hard times as a consequence of COVID-19. Given the Minister is the competent Minister, um, along with her colleague, the Finance Minister, can you tell me what supports you are bringing forward to help cross-border workers? And given that you have already said in your letter to me that self-employed and PAYE cross-border workers should access unemployment support in the country where they reside. Well, I think firstly the issue is something that you need to again take up with the Irish government um, and it is something that we have continually raised in terms of the Irish government, in terms of the payments that they have made. Sorry, if you let me finish and do not interrupt. Order, order members. Minister. Um, the other thing is, is that we do have social security benefits that are there that are open and accessible to people who need them. Um, this issue has obviously been raised in terms of the economy minister and others um, finance as well to look at what additional supports, but it has to be an engagement with the Irish government as well. There is social security that people can apply for. That is open for uh, people to apply for in terms of their residence being based here. 
There are complex issues, um, and obviously it's something that we need to look at going forward. I'm committed to looking at trying to find a solution, but it just doesn't rest within my department. There are issues with the Irish government as well that we need to continue to raise. And indeed, if you have solutions or ideas, come and speak to me uh, directly as well. I'm more than willing. My door is open. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I, I welcome the announcement from the Minister. Um, it will provide some relief to many of our local councils because, as we know, they are not legally protected from insolvency. So while this financial assistance may stave off bankruptcy for a few months, can I ask the Minister, um, who has already told us here today that she is able to bring forward legislation within weeks if the will is there to do so. So can I ask, is her department taking any legislative steps to avoid councils being forced to cut services or face enclosure, and have any of these steps, either in planning or already announced, been co-determined with NILGA or indeed the Council themselves? Thank you. Well, I'm continuing to work with councils, um, and we have been engaging over the last couple of months and weeks. I obviously did intervene um, in terms of a council who was going to let workers go, um, and advised that they should be exploring all other options first. Um, before letting workers go at this time because we need to retain our workforce as we move through this pandemic. And I am glad that the furlough scheme then was used. It was utilised in that council area and ensuring that those 70 odd staff were not let go. Um, I want to continue to work with councils in the time ahead in a collaborative way to look at the financial pressures that they have, um, to look at future investments that can be made, to look at regeneration, um, and I suppose capital investments that can be made within their council areas also. If there are legislative changes that are needed to do that, I am looking um, at all options. At the moment, nothing is closed. But it will be done in consultation with councils to look at their unique circumstances, what their pressures are. This is obviously a good announcement that we've managed to get the 20.5 million for these uh, first couple of months, and we'll start to move through the next phase of that in collaboration with councils, uh, with Nilga and with Solis as we go forward. And now I call Jim Allister to ask the question. Thank you. Uh, the scale of the distribution of Her Majesty's Treasury funds through the Minister's Department is very impressive and generous. But it can't go on forever at this scale. And the reminder today of 90% increase in unemployment in the month of April is a sobering thought. I therefore want to ask, yesterday we supposedly moved to step one of the easement. Step one in terms of employment says encouragement of those unable to work from home to return to the workplace on a phased basis subject to legal requirements and best practice. What encouragements have been issued on foot of step one which would ease the burden on her department? And could she expand for us what those encouragements are to people to get back into work? I'm glad the member got to ask his question in time. Um, and I suppose the first thing for me, I mean, I make no apologies for putting in implementations or measures that protect the most vulnerable and those who need it at this time and the support at this time. And I will continue to do that unapologetically um, in the time ahead um, in terms of engaging with citizens, because I think what the schemes and the take-up of schemes that have been implemented through my department shows is that people really need them um, at this point, and they will need them uh, going forward. Obviously, in terms of phase step one, uh, we have started. We didn't put deliberate dates, and indeed, each step is going to have a different approach as we move forward. Because we do. I mean, the virus is very much still here. People are very much still losing their lives, um, and I think um, as we move through each of the steps, um, it is important that we do have the most recent medical advice. Um, it is important uh, that the scientific advice and analysis is accurate. It is also important that any easements that have been made, we need to see what the impact of that is in terms of the virus. Our easements, and that takes a week or two in terms of that being known, um, and by way of the R number, um, which is referred to in terms of the rate of transmission. So we can't jump in and do all of these things at once, because if that sends the rate of transmission up above one, then that then puts an increased pressure on our public health service, which would actually be the wrong thing to do. And indeed, many members in this chamber would be getting up 
um, and rightly condemning it. I think in terms of workers, and I know through the economy department, there's obviously been a forum established working with trade unions, working with business representative bodies and with employers as well. Um, they obviously give guidance um, a few weeks ago in terms of essential workers and others. Uh, that forum is continuing its business and I think it's going to be critical because it's not a case of just opening up the economy again and getting people back into work. That has to be done in a safe way. There has to be measures put in place to ensure that social distancing is there, to ensure then that screens etc can be put up if that's what's needed. There are also other issues in that physical buildings. There's maybe only one toilet, so how do you clean those toilets? How do you ensure that surfaces are maintained? And we know from the recent medical advice that it's indoors is the highest risk still. That's why we couldn't move this week in terms of families meeting indoors, because it's the issue of shared surfaces, the transmission of the virus um, from those surfaces. So I'll continue to be guided by that medical and scientific advice. I will continue to be guided that I have to protect workers um, and also the public in terms of accessing, whether it's a local shop, whether it's a local social security office, to ensure that that's there, because people are still nervous. As I said, I was in Straban on Friday, um, and staff are comfortable with the measures that are there at the moment. But any easement in that, they want to assure that their safety is still the priority um, as well. That's notwithstanding the economic and social challenges then that that poses. But we do have to step through this to ensure that we keep that R rate um, as flat as possible to ensure that our, our health system can cope. So I'm going to continue to work on this in the time ahead. But again, that will be led by the medical advice and engagement with the trade unions and employers. And there are two final members who have indicated they wish to ask the question. That would ask for everyone's cooperation so that they will be able, be able to do so. I call Jerry Carl. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for her statement. I want to extend my uh, well wishes to her sister uh, as well. Um, I note the, uh, the almost 300 per cent raise um, in people accessing universal credit and with the fact that people are spending more on electricity, gas and utilities due to the fact that they are staying at home. It really brings the focus to the fact that welfare reform, uh, the measures implemented by this House, aren't fit for purpose. And there's been a lot of talk about a new normal at the end of this crisis, and if that is the case, uh, we can't return to a situation where people in work and out of work are forced Can to go to this banks. Question? Uh, just to move them a question, I wanted to ask the Minister about uh, private renters. Uh, since her department proposed the private tenancies modification bill, we know of scores of people who have been issued with threatening letters uh, from landlords they must pay their rent. And this disgraceful situation is happening, uh, of course, as we know students in particular are living with families that are practicing social distancing, etc. So I wanted to ask the Minister her view on this and what measures the executive intend to do at this time to protect and support private renters who are being pursued by landlords trying to maximise profit at this time. Thank you. Thanks very much um, for your questions. And I suppose there is a, a critical issue that needs to be looked at. Um, and again, I am more than willing to engage in terms of the issue of social security, but it is our economic levers. We do not have all of the economic levers to make the decisions that we want to make because we are reliant on a block grant from Westminster. Um, and I do think if we can get into a process of looking at those transfers of those levers that we can make all of the decisions um, that we want to make in the time ahead in terms of having the resources uh, there to do it. That said, I am looking at other options um, in terms of looking at resources, um, in terms of financial transactions capital. Are there other things that we could be doing as well uh, in the time ahead? The issue then of private renters, obviously the, the evictions bill was brought in, it was done in very quickly and obviously there were reasons uh, for doing that. That's not to say, I mean I have seen some of the correspondence from landlords who have stepped outside of the guidance that has been given my department and who have done that blatantly um, and I think I would encourage anyone um, to contact my department in terms of that and also Housing Rights Service who my department obviously funds. They provide an excellent service for those within the private rented sector also, and I would encourage people to go and get the legal advice that they have. 
Um, I am seeking, I mean, I'm going to be meeting with our housing division tomorrow, and this is one of the issues that I'm looking at, to look at what further interventions I can make as a minister um, in terms of some scrupulous landlords uh, that are using this pandemic in a way that um, is disgraceful, um, to be honest with you. Um, and I, if I can bring forward further protections or measures in the time ahead, then I'm more than willing to do that. And that concludes the one-hour period for questions to the Minister. <coughs> Point of order. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I am quite disappointed that, as the only member left to ask a question, I wasn't able to get in within that hour. Um, you gave the Minister her discretion in being able to finish her answer past the hour, so um, it's disappointing that you wouldn't allow me the opportunity to ask a question in less than two minutes. I think it's also disappointing that many members in this House can be represented by colleagues in asking their questions. However, as the only independent member of this House, I don't have that luxury. Therefore, I would appreciate the Speaker's uh, discretion to try and enable backbench members who are not members of the governing party to ask questions. The member has put her view on, on the record. Uh, it's something that we all will have to reflect upon. I did endeavour to get everyone in. I unfortunately missed it. I missed it by one on this occasion. Uh, and I will reflect on that myself in future and how I manage the business. Further point of order, Mr. Uh, uh, to come to the aid to a fellow deputy speaker, this is a plenary sitting of the House. It is not the ad hoc committee on COVID-19. The time period for questions to a minister is established in standing orders. It shall not exceed one hour. The ad hoc committee on COVID-19 has a greater flexibility, and that's why uh, that you have more more scope to uh, play about with it in that area. Uh, can, I, can I just say that you've, you too have put your, your view on the record, and, and thank you for expanding upon my, my own reasoning. Mr. Alistair, point of order. In an effort to be helpful to the House, <laughs> uh, I, th I think um, Ms. Sugden makes a very valid point. In your discretion, you could call her at a very early stage when the next minister is making his statement. Again, the member has put his view on the record for everyone to consider. Could members just take their ease for a few moments as the Minister of Finance takes his place?